Aside from seeing patients and writing notes, calling a consult is one of the most common clinical tasks that an intern performs. Maybe you had plenty of chances to do this as a med student, and it feels like no big deal to you, but you may never have considered what are best practices for calling consults. However, those best practices do exist that will make you a more effective communicator. I'm going to walk you through them, ending with a demonstration. The first steps in requesting a consult is to figure out who is the correct person to contact and to craft that initial text page. Things which that text page should include, your service, include which hospital if the consultant is covering multiple ones, the fact that it's about a new consult, an extremely brief summary, if urgent, mention that, and a callback number. For example, as a possible call to endocrine, Stanford CT surge calling regarding urgent new consult for a 50-year-old with suspected post-op adrenal crisis, 650-555-1234. Or a possible call to palliative care. VA medicine calling regarding new consult for 65-year-old with IPF considering inpatient hospice, 650-555-5678. It's poor form to page someone, particularly someone more senior than you, to a pager. So don't do that. Either page them to your personal cell or page them to a landline. But if you do the latter, you're committing yourself to sticking around by that phone for a good 10 minutes. When the call comes in from the consultant, what do you say? First, thank them for calling back. Introduce yourself and state which service you're calling from. I know you included this in your page, but just mention it again. And repeat the one phrase summary. State the name, medical record number of the patient, and the patient's location in the hospital. Then provide the story, but keep it concise. The consultant is going to want to see the patient themselves, of course. Take their own history and review the medical chart. You don't need to dive into their outpatient med list or what they do for a living, unless those details are central to the consult. As part of the story, predict what information the consultant will want to know. For example, if you're calling a general surgeon about a patient who may need urgent abdominal surgery, mention what prior surgeries the patient has had, with approximate dates, and when the patient has last eaten. If you're calling a psychiatrist about a patient with severe depression, mention whether they are currently or previously suicidal, and whether they have a prior history of involuntary admissions or involuntary holds of some kind. Giving the story on the phone serves four primary purposes to the consultant. It ensures that you've consulted the right service. It gives uh, context to your consult questions. It allows the consultant to judge the urgency of seeing the patient and gives the consultant an opportunity to suggest immediate interventions you should take before they've had a chance to see the patient. Once you've given a concise story, preferably no longer than 90 seconds, Ask your consult questions, making them as specific as possible. Now, if you're only calling the consult because your attending insisted that a service be on board and you don't have a specific question, you could explain that. Some consult fellows will appreciate the honesty and appreciate the position you're in as the intern, but other fellows might express annoyance or even decline to see the patient. So my advice is to think about the case and come up with something relevant to ask. If you find it impossible to ask a thoughtful question that is relevant and you don't already know the answer to, consider suggesting to your attending that you hold off on the consult altogether. Fellows at academic hospitals are really busy, and unlike attendings in private practice, they don't appreciate unnecessary calls about situations not warranting their expertise. Also, don't call a consult to request a procedure. For example, calling pulmonary because ID wants a patient with non-resolving pneumonia to get a bronch. Even if you are calling just to request a procedure that you're confident is appropriate, don't phrase it like that. No consultant wants to be spoken to as if they're an ancillary service not capable of offering input on the case. So instead, say something like, ID is suggested that a bronch might be helpful in this patient with non-resolving pneumonia, and we wanted to get your input on whether a bronchoscopy is the best next step at this point, or if there are better alternatives to identify the diagnosis. 
As the call comes to an end, don't forget to convey who the consultant should call with Rex, particularly if it will be another member of the primary team. And thank the consultant once again. So what might this look like in practice? Page to cardiology. Stanford Onc calling regarding new urgent consult for 60-year-old with advanced lung cancer and possible early tamponade. Current vitals, pulse 100, pressure 115 over 80, respiratory rate 24, callback number 650-555-4321. Hello, this is Eric from Medicine. Hey there, this is Steve from Cardiology, returning your call about the possible tamponade. Steve, thanks for calling back so quickly. As the page said, we have the 60-year-old with lung cancer and possible tamponade who looks uncomfortable but is grossly hemodynamically stable. Is now a good time to tell you a little about the patient? Yeah, yeah, please do. So this is Mr. Jones. Medical record number is 12345678. He is on F4 in room 418. He's a 60-year-old man with a past medical history of hypertension, but no known coronary disease or heart failure. Uh, three months ago, he was diagnosed with stage 3B non-small cell lung cancer, and he's currently between cycles three and four of initial chemotherapy. He presented to the ER last night, about 12 hours ago, with subacute progressive worsening of his chronic dyspnea. Um, but because of his immunosuppression and um, some infiltrates we saw on his uh, uh, chest X-ray, we initially thought that he was probably having pneumonia. We placed him on Zosin for broad coverage. Um, but unfortunately, this morning, he was looking a little bit worse. And we went ahead and got a CTA uh, of the thorax to rule out a PE. And the CT scan showed no PE, but it did show that he has a new pericardial effusion. Um, so we naturally went ahead and checked the pulses paradoxus. It was about 16, uh, 20 minutes ago. Uh, his vitals from around that time included uh, normal temperature, a pulse of 100, blood pressure 115 over 80, and a respiratory rate of 24, and an O2 set of 94% on two liters. Uh, he looks kind of subjectively uncomfortable, but is not necessarily in distress. His cardiovascular exam is notable for, just for the regular tachycardia, and he's got a JVP that's pretty elevated. Um, it was somewhere between 12 and 14 or so. Um, heart sounds are normal. They're not soft. Um, chest exam is notable for the fact he's got diffuse uh, crackles throughout the left lung, but that's actually uh, chronic for him uh, and, and has baseline, and the right lung is clear. Mr. Jones had lunch two hours ago, but he's currently NPO. He's full code. We have a liter of LR running right now. And I've placed a, a call to bed control to tentatively move him to a step-down unit. But if you think an ICU bed or CCU bed is more appropriate after you see him, I'm very happy to discuss that. Um, so our console questions for you are, one, is this patient experiencing tamponade? And two, do you think he needs a pericardiosynthesis? That's a great summary. Thanks. Um, I agree that it sounds like he, he may have tamponade, but is relatively stable right now. Um, I'm down here in the ER seeing this end STEMI. Do you think your patient's stable enough to wait for about 20 or 30 minutes for me to be up there? Yeah, I think so. I'll be camped out here at the nurse's station for a bit. Um, they're going to recheck his vitals right now and again in 30 minutes. If I'm not here when you arrive, just give me a text at this number and I'll come right over. Sounds great, Eric. Uh, keep the LR running and hold off on moving him, though, until uh, I get up and see him, just because if he needs a pericardiosynthesis after all, um, that's going to dictate sort of what unit, unit he can go to. Um, I'll be up in 20 to 30 minutes. Text me if anything changes before I get there. I will. Thanks again, Steve. So there you have calling a consult. Unfortunately, not every call will go that smoothly. No matter how clear or informative your request is, a consultant can be unusually busy and in a bad mood and still give you a little attitude if you missed some random detail. But if you stick to these principles, the overwhelming majority of consult requests will go well, making your life easier, and hopefully, the care of your patients a little better.